Wikis meeting. Um, I am Paul Wouters, I'm the area director. Um, unfortunately, uh, Tim Hollebeek um, got uh, tested positive for COVID, so he couldn't uh, be here to chair. And um, Logan is also remotely, um, but he's, he's with us as a uh, remote participant. Um, so I will mostly do all the dummy things that a chair does um, when sitting up front, managing the, the queues and doing the, um, the presentation uh, assisting. Um, and um, yeah, if you if, if any of you have had like some more closer contact with Tim during the week, um, maybe you want to do an extra test or something to make sure that you're also okay um, or that you're not okay. Uh, hoping that you're okay and not test positive. Um, so with that, um, I'll um, I'll hand over to Logan, who will give like a, a quick um, chair overview, and then um, we will have uh, six presentations. Um, does anyone want to do some agenda bashing? Additional items for now. Okay, great. Then the floor is for Logan. Uh, I think Goran has, uh, I think, a question. Maybe he has he entered the queue. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. Thanks, Logan. <clears throat> Just a question. When I read. When I now read the, um, the agenda, I note that there is one adoption call pending. But in the minutes, uh, there was actually, from the last meeting, there were actually two adoption calls discussed. Do you want to take that in all, uh, any other business? or? Yeah, let's take that to any other business. OK. Thank you. OK, thank you, Goran. So um, just a quick update. Uh, the most important update is that uh, we have a new chair. Uh, which is Tim. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here. So um, also, I have three things that I'd like to talk about. The first thing is that we've got uh, for this session, uh, Anthony Ja, who sends a slide for ACE, but it doesn't seem to correspond to any um, existing item agenda. And we didn't hear anything uh, from Anthony. So um, we sent an email and didn't get, get anything uh, from him. Uh, is he in the room or? No? OK. Nobody self-identifies or identifies anybody else as Anthony. <laughs> I understand. Thank you. So the other thing is that I forward a draft ITF is key group come with um, it's under expert review for a number of assignment. And the other thing that we also did, it was a bit last minute and um, based on the advice on Paul, we sent a second working group last call for ITF is working group co-op uh, EAP because of a large number of changes that happened between draft eight and nine. Uh, since we sent it on the 30th of October, we haven't received feedback. And we hope that the working group participant will take time to actually go through the changes and send the comments, hopefully, to the mailing list. Yeah, indeed. and just to clarify, so if, if there's actually no comments, then uh, I, as the AD, will actually just assume that there's no new issues raised during uh, in the changes in the document since it left the working group and went to the ISG. So, so we're, we're normally for a working group last call, if we don't get comments, we might say like, like uh, without more feedback, we're, we don't think this document is ready. In this case, this document is ready. This is just your last chance to see if you if you see any errors that happened in the process between uh, the document landing at the, at the IESG for publication requested and all the edits that happened up onto the RFC editor. So no comments means you agree. So thank you. Thank you, Paul. So uh, that's it on, on our side. Um, I don't know if Tim is online or he's able to join. Um, Tim, don't see me in the online participant. So I don't think he has any any words. So uh, with this, I think we can, I can leave the floor to Sigdem, which, Sigdem, are you ready to start? I am ready to start. Good. Thank you. This is Chidam Shangul uh, giving updates on the PubSub profile. Um, 
Next slide, please. This is a check whether you hear me or not as well. <laughs> so uh, yes, there's a chat, but for some reason, I no longer have the advancing slide control. So I'm not sure where it moved to. Oh, I don't see oh. anything either. Mm -hmm. So it says I'm, it, it tells me I'm sharing slides, but it's not actually. <laughs> Hold on. Um, hold on, I will try again. Sure. Can you maybe try and ask for the slide control? Maybe that button will appear for me. Um, okay, in the meantime, I'm contacting oh, I see, I see. Okay. Lorenzo. Okay, everything fixed? Sorry, I'll, I'll pass the control to you, Sigdim. Okay. Okay. So um, this document is focused on securing PubSub communication um, particularly for co-op clients, and it relies on several of the ACE documents um, for um, communication security, server authentication, and proof of possession ex uh, for access tokens. And it mainly is a profile for key group com. Uh, the last time it was presented, it was in um, version six. Now it's moved to version eight, and the majority of the work is regarding uh, satisfying the key CrookCom requirements and options. And uh, quite a bit of work has been done in that direction, leaving two uh, still outstanding in each category. So going back to the differences between version seven to version eight, um, the scope format was revised, uh, which was presented in the last meeting. Um, and it extended uh, beyond that. So I'll explain that the differences. We also revised the joint request response to the security group, that exchange. Some of these were triggered due to key group com changes regarding CNON's parameter uh, now needs to be present in join requests and the relaxed inclusion of peer roles parameter in the case of PubSub, because in our cases, the roles are very well defined um, and certain uh, permissions are only needed for certain roles like publishers. Uh, we also have the key ID now added as the group key, uh, used as the group identifier. Um, more detailed description of the encryption and signing operations are also now present in the draft with uh, more details on the construction of the AEA denotes. And then there are several clarifications and editorial improvements, but these were the main technical changes to the draft. Um, So um, the authorization flow is now has been completed. Um, the, it describes how the clients um, discover resources uh, at the broker through um, unauthorized requests and it learns about discovers authorization server, which is an option in the A stock uh, profile. Um, and then being able to um, do an authorization request to the authorization server to learn further more about um, the KDC and the security group that they needs to be part of to enable secure co group communication. Once that has been completed, then the um, client does an authorization request to the KDC, um, which enables it to upload its authorization. You know, when it gets the token, it can upload its authorization information to the KDC, and then. Um, uh, request to join a security group. After this point, the client will be able to get the necessary key material to be able to do secure um, pops up communication in the co-app group application group it's involved. So now this flow is established. 
Um, majority of um, the steps have been well defined. Um, the only part is the KDC, uh, the topic resource discovery, uh, besides a request to well-known core, how to enable different ways of discovering the KDC um, will be also included in the next iteration. Um, work has been done on the authorization request and scope. Um, in the previous meeting, we talked about um, a version of the scope. Now it's been defined very well. Um, as you've seen from the flow, the client makes two requests to the authorization server um, for two different audiences, broker and the KDC, to get two tokens to be part of an application group and to be part of a security group. Um, now these uh, requests, the scope um, contains the information about the topic that they are requesting permissions for, and then the permission details signals whether these permissions are admin level, which is not in the scope of this document, but was added to be um, future safe. Um, and then whether the permissions are applied to an application group or a security group, um, and whether these permissions represent a publish, read, or delete permission. Read also includes subscribe. So this has been now uh, finalized. The work that's been remaining is to add replay checks at the subscribers. This is going to be done similarly uh, to the approach used for OSCORE. Then finalizing, uh, meeting the requirement 10 and requirement 20. Requirement 10 is about um, expanding on a little bit um, discovery of the KDC. The current there is a current description of discovering to the, uh, through the well-known core, but we're exploring other options. Um, and the request 20 is about supporting group policies. Previously, we've, uh, we didn't uh, plan to support it, but now optionally it's supported and now we need to define the policy default values. Two options need to be supported regarding rekeying. At the moment, the draft describes rekeying toward using point-to-point -point group rekeying scheme. And we need to provide additional information about rekeying mechanisms supported in the draft. And that's the plan for the next version, which with that, the work for this draft will be complete. End of my presentation. Thank you. Any questions, comments? So then I guess we'll go on to the next presentation. Thank you. Thank you. OK, I tried to share. Or no, you are trying sharing. OK. <laughs> Do you want me to to forward the slides or whatever you want? Okay, you can forward them if you like. Okay, I'll just give you control. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Jan Selander. I'm going to talk about the Adult Oscor profile, which is now in version three. So here is a recap. Um, <clears throat> this is. Um, the basic, uh, the sort of a, a simple, kind of a simplified workflow is the optimized workflow in Appendix A2. Well, it, it's simplified in the sense that there are a few messages. It's still a um, perfectly reasonable um, workflow according to this profile. And it starts off with an ad hoc plus OSCORE uh, exchange between client and authorization server, uh, where ad hoc plus OSCORE means that we're using the the core draft uh, referenced at the bottom of this page. And with this uh, authentication, the client uh, can, in the third message, request an audience scope and a confirmation, uh, like a credential, um, <clears throat> or indicate with what credential it's going to use to authenticate to a resource server for, uh, for which it wants to request access. And then in the fourth message, the access token comes back with the granted audience scope and confirmation uh, claim. And this access token is then passed on from the client to the resource server. 
uh, in yet another run of end of source core, this time between client and resource server. And the two last messages in that, the, the last round trip in, in, of those two round trips is actually the, the request, the uh, request for a resource from the client to the resource server, which can now be authenticated, authorized, and communication can be protected. So that's basically an overview of what you can do with this, uh, this profile. And in this presentation, I like to go through the new things in version three, um, some sketches on next steps, and also ask for working group feedback on some of the, these points. So version three, um, here are, uh, this is a bullet list of changes in version three. And next slide will have some more detailed information of some of these bullets. Uh, we did an, a restructure presentation of the content. And there is a simplified uh, description of how we use ad hoc information. We re removed a lot of redundant information in both these two, two bullets. Um, then we merged two concepts, uh, two identifier concepts. Uh, which didn't, yeah, basically there were two different concepts and we only need one. We also enabled transport of access token in the third message between the client and resource server. Uh, we have defined semantics for, for uh, new confirmation methods and then some clarifications and editorials. So let's look at some of these uh, in more detail. Um, so th this was a kind of an, an effort, actually. We, we rewrote the, the, the uh, basic content of the drafts. So exclude the security, privacy, and IANA uh, considerations. Uh, we re rewrote things and, and restructured uh, large parts, uh, which um, we think is much more readable now. Hope uh, others also agree. It didn't change the number of pages, so it's still 28 pages for the for the core of the document, and that should let's let's try to hope we can keep it small. Um, yeah, so that was uh, one of the main changes actually. Then we added two new sections, um, and this is uh, essentially doing the footwork for being able to use uh, all these Cbor header uh, maps. So, for, if you remember ad hoc, you can authenticate not necessarily with only with, um, with certificates. You could use uh, Cbor web tokens, or you can use Cbor web token claim sets. And there are other ways of identifying credentials. So that provided a new set of, of, of cozy header maps. And here is the definition of the, con the associated confirmation methods. So this is the CNF claim uh, in, uh, that comes into the access token. And all this is basically mimicking the semantics described for these coser, he, cozy headers in other um, drafts. So for example, RFC 9390, which is the X509 uh, for cozy, uh, C509, which is the, um, which is the cozy draft describing Seabor uh, encoded X509, and a couple of he header maps comes from ad hoc as well. For for JSON web tokens, there is additionally um, confirmation methods based on the JSON web signatures RC seventy five fifty. So that's a little bit of administration, but we need, still needed to do that. Then we have this uh, merge of, of, of two different concepts. So uh, in another draft uh, referenced here, there is a, a definition of a token series originally coming from text was in this draft, but we moved it to a separate draft. And the general concept uh, when applied to this draft, uh, a token series is, is like a sequence of access token updating each other. Uh, and the series is valid as long as the ad hoc session is valid. So, so to be able to identify this series, we don't need a separate identifier. We can just uh, pay attention to the ad hoc session. So when the ad hoc session change, the uh, token series change. So that's simplified, at least conceptually. Uh, and then we also introduced the term session ID 
in the ad hoc information, which is kind of natural if this, since this contains all the information related to ad hoc. Okay, um, then we have this uh, alternative transport of the access token. So in previous versions, we, um, uh, we allowed two ways of, of carrying the access token, either as in described in the ACE framework, that you basically do a post to the slash authorization info, and uh, in the payload, you put the access token. That's a method that still is supported. And uh, that would mean that the access token is in plain text because that's basically first contact between client and resource server. And then we have defined in, in, in this draft, previous versions of this draft, that you may carry the access token in EAD1, the first uh, message of ad hoc, the external authorization data one. And that uh, still uh, leaves the access token unprotected, as, as in the case of using post to slash authorization info. And what we got uh, feedback from was people working on a proof of concept uh, uh, for a um, certain industrial application that they wanted to protect the access token. They wanted more specifically to encrypt the, the access token between client and resource server. The client already knows, of course, what type of access it will get and what resources are relevant. So, so this is not so much hiding it for, for the client, but it's for hiding this information for a third party. And the good thing now, if we are passing the access token in message three instead of message one, is that we have come much further in the authentication protocol. So, so message three is actually, uh, the EAD three is actually encrypted. And we have, uh, the client has already authenticated the resource server. So it's clear what is the receiver of the access token. So that's what we did uh, for this version. Now we allow, in addition to post slash authorization info, either EAD1 or EAD3. But the question I'd like to raise in the working group is, do we really need to use this case of EAD1? Do we need, really need that option? or should we restrict ourselves to EAD3? Um, either that we have, I mean, still we have the post slash authorization info, but we could also consider to remove that case as well. That, that's not, that's beyond what's in this slide, but uh, um, if someone has any ideas around that. So what I'm saying is basically that uh, with EAD3, we get confidential protection of the access token. You don't have to cache the access token. You don't need it basically before um, message three because that's when the resource server authenticates the client. Uh, is there any reason why we should keep this in AD1? Anyone has an opinion? Uh, no one seems to be walking to the microphone. Okay, no strong opinion. So then my proposal is actually that we remove it from EAD1. And, and, and if we take it one step further, we could even consider for this profile to not allow um, access tokens being transported in plain text. We could remove the post slash authorization info um, for this unprotected case. Because as you remember, how you update the access token later, if the client wants to have additional rights or extended rights, the client would make a request to the authorization server in OSCOR, get back an access token, and it would post to authorization info over OSCOR. So it, it would be protected. The subsequent update of, of, of access rights would be protected. So if we take away these two options, uh, which are un unprotected, currently we would always have an encrypted delivery of the access token. Something to consider, um, if you don't, even if you don't have any input right now. Oh, Marco has an input. Go ahead, Marco. Uh, Marco Tiroka, uh, there is still one case if we want to consider the use of the alternative workflow uh, for uploading, uh, well, the first access token of the token series uh, going through DAS as described in that other document. <laughs> Uh, that's at least one case uh, warranting uh, to, to keep uh, the option of uploading the access token it in, in our Z-info. Um, so that, that's a strong justification, I think. On EAD1, I, I 
can live with removing <laughs> that possibility. I can see the point. To be fair, an advantage of that way uh, is that if there's something going wrong, uh, the ad hoc execution will be aborted earlier. But the benefits of encrypting the token in AD3 instead, I think, overweigh that. Thanks, Marco. <clears throat> I have some responses. Uh, so first of all, in, in case of the uh, alternative workflow, which is the case when the authorization server is posting to the resource server, I think we should try to make that um, protected because there is the, the re authorization server and the resource server have a prior um, security relationship. They have established trust at some point. So we can also require that to be protected. That's one comment. And the second comment about uh, EAD1, uh, sorry, I don't think that was, I forgot the second point. So, so it was basically you saying that we could omit, uh, EAD, you were happy with omitting EAD1, which is fine. And um, yeah, yes, you were saying that EAD1, putting it in EAD1 enables an early abort. And I'm not sure that is true, actually, in the sense that if there is an active attacker, then the active attacker can present the valid access token in message one, and it can't be verified because you would only be able to verify that when you have authenticated the client in message three. So yes, certain cases with naive uh, access token uh, being injected could, or, or accidental could, could be verified, but attacks could not be verified at that stage anyway. Okay, uh, unless there are other comments, I'll move on. Thanks very much, Marco, for the feedback and more feedback is welcome. So that leaves us with, with, with the next steps and uh, what we have looked at in is uh, a little bit at the, uh, how we can compress the information in the access token. Since this is a constraint setting, uh, we'd like to, to block information as as much as possible. And one way to do it, that is to make use of a lake draft called application profiles, which is defining uh, a set of ad hoc info with, with an in, as an integer. So it's, it's basically, if you look at the red boxes on the right hand side, it's basically replacing some information of the, kind, of the second kind with that of the first kind, where it should probably shouldn't be an array, should just be the number two, integer two. Anyway, just a, a sketch to think of that the application profile, the cap ad hoc capabilities could be shortened in the interest of making this information more compact. So that's some, something we'd like to bring in. Um, then we've had a request uh, for group audience to handle one access token handling multiple resource servers. And there are different takes on that. One is that we have ad hoc information for, for different receivers or that we have common information. And um, that's not really sorted out yet, but that's one next step we'd like to add. And the third bullet of, of this, um, which is also kind of a major consideration to make is how we handle proof of possession of the client private key uh, against AES in the case when that it's using different keys against AES and against RS. Uh, so we need to think about if we should uh, define how to do explicit pop. Um, there is uh, pre precedence in other drafts we could use. And we like to add more security considerations now con of, the, of the type we, we, we just discussed on, on carrying uh, access token ED3. And more reviews are welcome. This is the set of open issues we have on the table. So unless there is much more, we hope to be able to progress this for in for a, a uh, review ready uh, in a review ready shape pretty soon okay thanks thanks any questions or comments on this presentation it seems not so going to the next one thank you um Karen. thank you
Do you want control of the slides or do you want me to run yes, the slides? Yes, please. Yes, please. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So hi all, this is Malisha Vucinic. Uh, I will be presenting an update to the draft uh, EST OSCOR, which specifies how to transport EST payloads within OSCOR. So the status of this draft is that we uh, received a review from John Matson on 19th of September. Uh, this was a review that went to the mailing list. And after that review, we did some updates and published O3 on 23rd of October, which partially addresses the issues raised in John's review. And the goal of my presentation today will be to present the resolutions to those issues uh, that were raised in John's review, as well as to discuss uh, the open issues uh, on the issue tracker. So I will start with issues that have been resolved uh, and merged. Uh, please comment, interrupt me if there is anything uh, that you see off in this uh, in the resolutions. So the first issue, number 15, is how does a client obtain the Diffie-Hellman key of a server uh, in the case of enrollment of st static Diffie-Hellman keys? So the context here is that when enrolling static Diffie-Hellman key, proof of possession can proof of possession cannot be a signature. Obviously, it can uh, only be a, a MAC, and MAC is computed with a key generated from a shared Diffie-Hellman secret. And essentially, to compute this secret, client needs the server's public Diffie-Hellman key. And previously, we what we what we were using was we were using an EST function certs. Uh, for the client to explicitly fetch the uh, get the uh, certificate, the public uh, key certificate from the server uh, using this function. John commented that this is suboptimal and that it seems very inefficient, and he proposed an optimization to the flow to use the ephemeral key from ad hoc when ad hoc precedes enrollment. And essentially, the proposal is to use the uh, that the client uses this uh, the ephemeral key that it received in the ad hoc handshake from the res ad hoc responder, and use that as the public key to to generate um, uh, uh, the secret and uh, finally to generate a key for the Mac. So the action that we've taken is that we uh, we explained specified this as an optimization where uh, in case when ad hoc and combined ad hoc OSCOR delivery precedes enrollment, and we state that the client must use the public ephemeral key of the ad hoc responder G of Y as the recipient public key, and this PR has been merged. And I would like to see if there are any objections to this being done in uh, in the, this document. There's one thumbs up from the room, but nobody's walking to the mic. Okay. So, all right. So I'll I'll go ahead. The second issue is number nine: connection-based proof of possession. And connection-based proof of possession essentially uh, is, uh, it uh, describes the binding between the certification signing request and the underlying secure transport layer. So it is achieved by including the uh, challenge password attribute in the CSR that depends on the ongoing security session. And uh, since we just discussed the use of the ephemeral key in the uh, in the generation of the Mac in the proof of possession uh, of the CSR, uh, when ad hoc is used, this uh, connection-based proof of possession is kind of implicitly done, uh, as as I just explained, and the ad hoc session is bound to the CSR without the need for additional bytes to be transported in this challenge password field. So uh, what we did is that we removed uh, the specification of explicit uh, connection-based proof of possession using the ad hoc unique byte string that, was, that used to be used as a challenge password and made it optional and specified that uh, this can be uh, done by an application profile. Uh, 
uh, but is out of scope of this application with an added security consideration that we achieve this binding with ad hoc uh, when ad hoc is used by the usage of the ephemeral key to compute the MAC during the enrollment of static difficult monkeys. So this was also merged. So I will proceed uh, to the next one. So these were two, uh, I would say, non-editorial technical uh, changes that we what we did in O3. Uh, the uh, the rest of the stuff that was fixed were mostly editorial uh, changes on some consolidation of references, boilerplate, uh, explicitly stating the type of certificates in section on optimizations, some illustrations, update of figures, some incorrect uh, referencing to the OSCOR draft where we removed the sentence on HKDF, uh, added acknowledgement and additional optimization, uh, and added an additional optimization editorially in section 3.4. So I will now skip to the open issues that I would like to discuss with the working group. And uh, the first one is on normative requirements on content format support, which is essentially ASN1 or CBOR content formats. What this means is that uh, our draft currently may transport both ASN1 or CBOR objects. Uh, content type negotiation in the EST happens through, through the accept option of co-op, but we need to specify some normative requirements on what is supported on the client side and on the server side in terms of the, of the objects, object encodings. And uh, the pro uh, I have here some proposed text and the aim is to keep backwards compatibility. And the goal of the proposed text that you can see in this slide is to, uh, to keep backwards compatibility by, uh, uh, by, recommend by having a should on the server side supporting both ASN1 and Seaborn encoded objects. And then uh, we state, uh, I quote, it is up to the client to support only ASN1, CBOR encoding, or both. And then as a reminder, content format negotiation happens through co-ops accept option present in the request. I see ESCO in the queue. Yeah, we'll the mic now. So, uh, I'm hope I'm not interrupting uh, here. Um, I, I was thinking you wanted to have some feedback on the text. Okay. So, yes, sure. And yeah, I was thinking that, that we can phrase it like this with the capital shoot. Mm -hmm. And if, if that is used, there is also the need to add some exception case. So when is it okay to not support both? Mm -hmm. I think that, that this could be something like, okay, if you are deploying a system and you know that all the clients will only use uh, format one. In that case, it's okay if, if the server uh, only supports format one and the same for format two. Mm -hmm. So norm normally, uh, I think the design concept we use also in the Anima working group is that the server needs to support all the formats and then the client picks, constrained client picks one of them uh, typically. Okay, which is okay. what is pr proposed, right? Uh, yeah, so, this yeah. is, uh, I think, the proposal. Yeah, the only thing is that for the for the shoot, we need to add some text Except. describing the uh, exception, I think, uh, here. And uh, while we are looking at this, I think it's also good to consider uh, one other thing. There's, uh, there's basically the slash search request so to get CA certificates. And that has a, a small problem or bug, I think, I believe, that came from the EST Co-op S RFC. So there's a problem that um, I think it, it said that it's okay for the server to support only one format and the client could, in principle, support the other format. So then you don't have uh, a good match because the client will ask for uh, CA certificates in one format and the server will only support CA certificates in another format. So. I think it's also good to check that case and if possible, uh, fix it as well. Um, because that's, yeah, that's a bit of a weird situation, I think. So, uh, so that means that basically the client could do a slash search request and ask 
in a format that the server doesn't support. Uh, that's basically the problem we have. And at Anima Working Group, we are also looking at adding another format uh, because we had some problems with the, yeah, the PKCS7 uh, wrapper format. It's, it's not always supported by the crypto library. So we are thinking about adding a new format there. Uh, so that's just for information. <laughs> that's ongoing work. So. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for your, uh, for your input. I'll take an action on this. Marco? Uh, Marco Tiloka, uh, yeah, I think this proposal is overall uh, good. Uh, um, specifically on the uh, negotiation, the accept option is critical. So you may want to, to be a bit more explicit and say that the EST server must support it, uh, since you want, in general, negotiation to be possible. And I remember you had a section already when you discussed uh, with normative language the, the support of the options on the two different sides. And, well, um, if you want to admit negotiation in general, um, yeah, it's best to say uh, that the server must support the accept option. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, if there are no other comments, I will uh, proceed. Uh, the next open issue is 34. Payload formats should explicitly mention seaboard encoded objects. This is mostly, uh, uh, I would say it's editorial, uh, but it's important for the comprehension of the draft on what happens with TST, what, what uh, types of objects are exchanged in different messages and for different functions. Uh, we currently have table two in the draft that gives a summary of ASN1 media types carried within requests and responses for each of the supported functions. And just an editorial proposal would be to add an equivalent for seaborne encoded objects as registered in the COSE draft. Uh, but there is a caveat here that we are currently missing a uh, media type re registration for PKCS10 and seaboard encoding and media type for PKCS8, which is used for transport of the private key in server-generated server scenarios. So I made an action already to uh, reach out to the authors of this COSI draft to include these uh, registrations in their, in their draft that we are having a normative dependency on. So I see Joran uh, in the queue, yeah. Yeah, and I should say that, yes, we noted that re request and we will comply. <laughs> we will okay. provide those specifications. Okay, great, thank you. So I will, if there are no other comments on this, I will proceed. So this is issue number 17, which was raised in John's review. Uh, where we explicitly state that uh, in the draft, as a reminder, we explicitly state that ad hoc external authorization data fields are intentionally not used to carry EST payloads because ad hoc needs to be as executed in the case, uh, because ad hoc needs to be executed in case of re enrollment. So, as a reminder, uh, uh, during initial enrollment, we might get away with transporting uh, uh, EST in ad hoc, but then during re-enrollment, we would then need to require ad hoc be executed again without uh, without any need when it we can only leverage the existing security, the already uh, the keys that are already in place, and just use an OSCOR session. So this was previously discussed in the uh, during the San Francisco and a meeting and one interim of ACE, uh, and the working group agreed to not use EAD fields for the transport of EST OSCOR and instead to use OSCOR uh, to use OSCOR uh, instead. Therefore, the name of the draft EST OSCOR. So the context here is that uh, IoT device lifetime is on the order of several years, so we definitely need to support re-enrollment. Uh, and that separate code paths for re-enrollment and enrollment would complicate the implementation. And uh, it is possible to do, in any case, it is possible to do enrollment with combined ad hoc and OSCOR delivery as, uh, as specified in the, in the core draft. 
So in that way, the initial enrollment can happen in ad hoc message three and four, which is what John is proposing when he uh, when he wanted to transport uh, the EST object within uh, within EAD of ad hoc. So my proposal here would be to keep enrollment in OSCOR as it is right now and to discuss editorially the option for combined ad hoc OSCOR delivery uh, in the draft. I see Logan in the queue. Uh, yes, Marisa, just um, as a, a reminder, um, we, we need to um, be mindful of the time that we have for this session. And if we could go a little bit faster so that the others can present as well, that would be nice, Marisa. Yeah, okay, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm nearly through, so it should, be, it should be quick from this point on. So I just want to check if there are any objections to, uh, to, to, to this, to this way forward. I hear none, so I, I, I guess I can move on. Yes. Uh, there is number 14 on the update of RFC 9148, uh, essentially uh, where John's comment is that uh, he is referring to section 5 of RFC 9148 that discusses HTTPS co-op register, which acts as a HTTP to co-op proxy. And, uh, we, and which enables the EST server to talk only HTTP TLS. And, and uh, having a clear boundary between HTTPS session and the co-op session. Uh, and in the case of server-generated private keys, uh, which are not encrypted at the object level, these keys may be visible to, this, uh, to, the, uh, to the proxy. So John is commenting on this, that this is something that is not recommended. Uh, and that he thinks it's a bad security practice. Uh, so, and he's proposing to update RFC 9148. Uh, so I'm a little hesitant to do that uh, because it's a different set of security properties between HTTPS and OSCOR. OSCOR traverses the proxies and achieves end-to-end -end security even in presence of proxies. So we are not exactly in the same situation. And uh, my proposal here would be to add a security consideration on this in EST OSCOR. Unless there is any objection, of course. No, please go ahead. OK. And uh, there are a set of open editorial issues, uh, which uh, the author team does not think deserve particular discussion at the, this meeting. In the, in the uh, interest of time, I will just skip this uh, and go to the next steps. So the next steps for us is to resolve the, these open issues that we discussed in the meeting and that we agreed. And then finally, it would be great if we, we would have another round of reviews before uh, the working group last call. Any questions or comments? Okay, thank you. Hi everyone, uh, this is Marco. This is an update on the uh, GM admin document. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, I prefer to give a recap uh, this time. Um, this is still considering the group manager um, for the group score protocol, uh, for which we have another document that defines um, an interface intended for group members uh, to join and interact more with the group manager once group members. Uh, but this particular document introduces uh, a second interface at the same group manager uh, in the interest of ACE clients that act as uh, administrators. So they can uh, create, configure, reconfigure, um, delete um, those groups. Um, so in addition to the original interface, uh, this one adds uh, some new concepts, of course. Uh, first of all, a single instance uh, of a new resource at the group manager, uh, a group collection. Um, just as an example, I expect it to be at something like slash manage and uh, a number of uh, child resources uh, of that group collection called group configuration, 
uh, each uh, for each group uh, currently available at the group manager, say with, with name uh, group name. And that's where you would find the configuration uh, of the group in question. So the administrators for the group in question here uh, would be the ACE clients. And uh, like uh, for the other interface, the group manager is still the, uh, the resource server. And we use ACE to enforce access control and the right permissions of the administrator in this case uh, to operate um, at the group manager. Uh, next slide, please. And this is a visual recap of the operations that are uh, possible to do on those resources. And the administrator can, first of all, operate on the single instance of this group collection and resource uh, for the sake of retrieving the uh, full or partial list uh, of existing groups. Uh, or they can create a new group, uh, sending a post request to the group collection. So the result would be creating one child uh, group configuration resource uh, containing the, uh, the configuration for that group. And not shown in, the in this figure for simplicity, but um, a sister resource uh, would also be created uh, that group members or candidate group members can access uh, to join the group. Uh, and that's the topic of that other document, in fact. Uh, or the administrator can access one existing group configuration resource uh, for uh, retrieving uh, the whole configuration, part of it according to filter criteria, or uh, override it altogether, change it selectively, uh, or delete it, meaning the group is deleted, uh, meaning the, the sister resource for joining the group is also deleted, and, and the group is no more. Um, next slide, please. So this has all been stable for a couple of years, if not more, um, already. Uh, in this late uh, version, we made yet another um, editorial pass with some improvements and fixes. And we also noted that following the split out uh, of the use of this interface using Coral, which is now a separate uh, working group document, there was still some uh, Coral-related uh, text remnant uh, around this document, and we, we took it away. There was just a cleanup. And we also noted that uh, a number of error responses were supposed to be uh, plain and simple, not adding really uh, any any information, but uh, for a lazy copy paste, probably some, some additional information that mm, is not really pertinent to those error responses was still around and, and we removed that too. So now it's um, as intended. Uh, we also prefer to be even more uh, precise in uh, clarifying the behavior of the uh, uh, put uh, operation on a group configuration that the administrator can perform for um, overwriting the group configuration. And we were saying already that uh, certain information, certain parameters uh, must not be included in that put request or are, are just wrong. Uh, but we want to be very clear that uh, the information corresponding to those parameters in the current configuration is also not supposed to be changed, uh, not, even, not even automatically internally by the group manager, for example, following default parameters. Those values have to remain uh, as they are uh, since the group creation. And it applies to four parameters, I think. Uh, next slide, please. Um, OK, to, to give a bit of background to understand also this uh, further clarification, uh, and this first part is unchanged uh, content. Uh, from the beginning of this work, we followed an approach such that um, the administrator requests to create a group suggesting a name. But then the group manager can have thousand reasons to reject that name, not necessarily because it's taken already, but because it's just uh, not nice, it's inconvenient, whatever. So can reject that proposal and go for something else, um, if possible, at all. So it may end up well. Uh, the group manager chooses a different name, uh, creates the group, uh, and replies uh, to the admin saying, I've created the group. Uh, here's the name you have to consider. This is uh, the name I picked up. Um, and this is unchanged. Uh, what we changed is um, achieving a simpler uh, text uh, to clarify that uh, the group manager is not supposed to necessarily find uh, a name. It is supposed to try. Then uh, it may fail uh, in finding um, a new name. It doesn't have to perform an exhaustive research uh, over a possible uh, space of names. It may decide to, to, to give up uh, or, or whatever. So we rephrased some uh, text in different parts of the draft to, to reflect this. Um, it must try. And of course, it may fail or, or give up. And that's also why it's more appropriate to use a better name for the error uh, associated with this uh, condition, unable to determine a group name. Doesn't mean that uh, a group name doesn't absolutely um, exist. And we also simplify the text about the high level steps 
that the group manager can take to try to determine uh, the new name, but then of course the, uh, the details are uh, implementation specific. Uh, we also ha have had for a while guidelines for the client that receives uh, that particular error, how it is supposed to react, and we just revise the text to be more consistent uh, with the revision uh, of the related text um, I've just mentioned. So no, no breaking change, no real diversion from what was happening already, uh, just uh, text uh, clearer and hopefully simpler. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and that's all. We believe this version 10 is, is ready for working group last call. We raised that already in July. We understood that was the case, but uh, since the last call didn't happen, well, we took the opportunity to improve the document even a bit more. So maybe now we are more than ready uh, for working group last call and to further support it. Uh, now we also have a, a proof of concept uh, implementation for Eclipse Californium available at the same repo where we, we have uh, well, the ACE uh, framework implementation in the first place with uh, its profiles. And this is next to uh, the other interface of the group manager that I mentioned at the beginning in the interest of the, the joining nodes. Uh, so yeah, we think the document um, is ready. And as a side note, I raise again that we have a technical problem <laughs> with the GitHub repo where, um, as far as I understand, the um, HTML editor's copy is built, but is not deployed. So if you try to follow the link, uh, you, you get a 404. And I think someone with admin permissions on the repo uh, can fix this. I don't know who can exactly. But, uh, we can live with that. It's just going to be more and more inconvenient as we go forward. <laughs> OK, I'll, I'll look into this. Uh... Thank you, Lorena. So can we expect a working group plus call starting soon? The authors believe the uh, document is stable for that. So, so I'm not the chair, but I'm sure the chair will take this into consideration after they uh, okay. catch up on this week. OK, thank you. OK, I'm done with that. Then I think there's the next one now. That's the workflow one, right? Yes, what was in files? Okay, um, yeah, this is an update of a, a way newer work, uh, work from parents presented for the first time um, in July in San Francisco. Uh, next slide, please. So to bring the topic uh, up again, uh, the intention of this draft is to uh, formally update uh, the ACE framework RFC in 9200 in two respects. Um, the first one is introducing um, an alternative workflow uh, where uh, the authorization server uh, uploads the access token to the resource server uh, on behalf uh, of the client. So there's no intention to replace the original workflow or together the AS can, can choose on a per situation, per client basis. But still, we would like to admit it. And we got quite good reaction and feedback about introducing this um, in San Francisco. Um, as a second contribution, we are defining a number of, of new um, parameters uh, to be used in the message exchange, uh, in particular between the authorization server uh, and the client. And there we have revised uh, part of the draft, as I'll show in the following um, slides. Uh, next, please. OK, I, I won't be talking about this um, that long. And if you want, there's an example in, in the backup slides. Uh, we haven't changed this uh, in this uh, new version of the draft, but it's about a new workflow dimension. Uh, the client still requests for an access token, and the authorization server can decide to uh, upload the token by itself uh, to, the, um, to the resource server. Uh, so a response will follow up. And, and this operation may succeed or may fail. But since it has happened, the authorization server will include in the response to the client an additional uh, parameter token uploaded uh, to indicate that this has happened. And if the outcome was a success, in that case, the parameter is true and the access token is not included again, uh, or it failed. So the value is false and the access token is included so that the client, um, if it wants to, uh, can try by itself and maybe will have uh, better luck. Uh, next slide, please. On the new parameters, well, I've just mentioned the token uploaded one. That, that's one of those. It's specifically intended uh, to support the alternative workflow. You saw that um, in the previous slide. No changes on that. 
Uh, then we have uh, another set uh, of parameters that are intended to transport uh, basically multiple um, authentication credentials of resource servers, uh, rather than one only, um, in the response from the authorization server uh, to the client. Um, and that's especially useful to concretely support um, in all uh, the profiles of ACE, the concept of group audience, where the token is issued as intended to uh, multiple. Um, resource servers, uh, not one only. Uh, we had RSCNF2 around already. I'll quickly go through it again. Uh, out 2 is, uh, well, a major revision of what used to be uh, subject IDs, uh, taking into account uh, proposals mostly from, from Christian Ansus. And Anchor CNF um, is a brand new one that can be used um, as an alternative, basically. Um, next, please. Yeah, this is an example showing the two new parameters, uh, RSCNF2 and OUT2 uh, combined together. And RSCNF2, again, uh, is unchanged um, since, the, since the first version. And you can really think of it as the, the structured version of what we already have as RSCNF. Uh, so you don't indicate only one authentication credential of uh, the single resource server for which the token is, is intended to, but uh, you indicate uh, an order set uh, of authentication credentials for all the resource servers um, in the group audience. And then you have the parameter out to uh, this as a way uh, simpler and intuitive uh, semantics than the previous uh, subject IDs that we replaced, and uh, very much aligned with the semantic of the simpler um, out. So its content uh, is a, a list of identifiers of uh, resource servers, uh, really in general. And their value are the identifiers of those resource servers that you would use uh, if you ask for an access token for each of those individual resource servers. Uh, so if you ask, uh, in principle, for an access token with uh, out RS1, you are targeting the same resource server that you mean here in this example where RS1 is indicated as first element uh, of out 2 But if you use RS CNF2, then you must also include out2 to discriminate uh, which authentication credential is for which uh, authentication server um, specifically, uh, resource server specifically, sorry. Next slide, please. So that's a way to go uh, that you can build with those two uh, parameters. Uh, there's a totally a different way that considers a new parameter we introduced in this version of the document, uh, Anchor CNF. Uh, in principle, it's very similar to RS uh, CNF2, at least in terms of semantic. It's a set of authentication credentials, but mm, they are not related to resource servers. Uh, these are authentication credentials of um, trusted parties or, or trust anchors. And this is the idea. Uh, say the client receives uh, the response in the example, uh, including well, only one uh, authentication credential for one trust anchor. This means that later on, that client can somehow, we don't care how, uh, obtain authentication credentials of some resource servers. And the client is happy to uh, go ahead and use them with those resource servers, as long as the client can verify those authentication credentials using any of the trust anchor authentication credentials uh, specified in Anchor CNF. So it's like if the authorization server is uh, delegating uh, the trust in the credential validation to the trust anchors uh, for which the credentials are specified um, in Anchor CNF. And if you want to add uh, an extra uh, layer of, pre of uh, precision and accuracy, but it's just optional, you can further rely on out two that we saw in the previous slide uh, to have an additional level of filtering and limiting this uh, also to particular resource server um, only, but that's, uh, that's optional. So if this is all acceptable, and most likely it is uh, in many deployments, the benefits are clearly that uh, the response to the client is smaller in terms of size because you don't have to um, include all the authentication credentials of all the resource servers uh, in the group audience. Uh, you, you are limited to a few or maybe even one only authentication credential uh, of trust anchors. And uh, this is going to work seamlessly in case resource servers are deployed uh, later on uh, after the access token um, is issued. Next slide, please. And this is what we have so far. This is what the draft uh, is about. And honestly, this is the, the main content we've had uh, in mind about it for a while. 
we have a, a roadmap uh, ahead for a possible things to consider um, to do along the same lines, of course, uh, parameters. And that's compiled in Appendix B for now, but it was um, less urgent. And uh, to connect the dots a bit here, um, thinking of the, uh, the Edo Coscore profile that Joran presented before, that profile um, is also um, using as an optional choice, of course, the alternative workflow. And to appear in the next version of the document will show also the possible use uh, of the new parameters um, presented here. So already in July, uh, there was um, interest for, for adopting this. And uh, as it was mentioned in the agenda, the adoption call is pending. Thanks. Any questions or comments? OK, thank you. Thanks. I'm looking at there's a presentation marked in the agenda for the distributed the distributed auth caps for distributed auth, but I'm not sure I see a matching deck to be shared unless that's the deck Anthony Gia side. Can you just have a peek? Is it am I just overlooking it? Or is it not here? Okay, let me see if I can update that. Uh, There should be no mixed material, is there? I'm not entirely sure what's happening there. Let me see if it's on the if I in a new in a new in a new client. It is really quite Are they in the data track? I can share my screen. Uh, no. Or... Yeah, uh, in the data track of the slides. Yeah. No? No, they're not. I, okay. I didn't put it. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry. They, I, okay. I don't have the slides then. Okay. All right. Um, without slides, try this. Um, so first of all, I have nothing to do with ACE. I got nudged here by, by somebody who said I should try this, so let's see. Um, what I'm sort of um, concerned with in the work I'm doing is environments in which connectivity no longer exists, even though it should, right? So how do you do authorization then? Um, authentication is out of scope. We assume that there's something pre-authenticated already happening. Um, so authorization, what am I doing? I'm just looking at um, just looking at sort of encoding credentials in a, in, a, in a token that I sign, transmit it by some path either to the client or to the uh, resource server, <laughs> pretty much what you just described. Either workflow works what, because it's signed by a trusted authority, and then it should contain enough information that you can that the resource, the resource server can, can decide what to do. Roughly, what you're doing here is, is, is pretty similar, so I'm not sure whether this has any is of any interest to you. 
the only thing I'm um, sort of concerned with on my end is nothing co-op related, nothing, nothing that, you know, <laughs> about your previous work here is that I can do this in, hopefully do this in, in zero round trips. Because if I, if I have a very um, spotty, unreliable network, which is sort of the conditions I'm working with, um, then that should still yield some results. And the main question was, and I can't show you very much here without slides. Um, we have them in a second. Yeah, that's okay. The main question was whether there's any interest here in this working group for this kind of situation, or if you assume better connectivity at most times, is this something? Use cases. Um, I have a background in doing, before I started on this, in um, communica communications for commercial drones. That's where some of these use cases come from. You fly out a drone over a forest, you need to send it a signal to change its path. How does the drone know that this signal is acceptable or not when it has no connection to, to, to its original ground control station anymore? So that's that kind of situation, right? You have a yeah, I would like to <laughs> talk about this in a more structured way. Um, it but it has no relation directly to co-op or to anything what I've seen so far, except that it's sort of in the same problem space, roughly. And I wonder whether there's an interest in this kind of thing. So meanwhile, yeah. the, the, sorry, the slides are in the data tracker, so we can. Are they, so you will, put them in the data. Uh, uh, so they I, are. Down, uh, I send them to the chairs. So that's that's all I did. I will, I will share my screen because I see them, but I don't seem to be able to, be able to share that. All so right, I will just okay. share my screen. So give me a second. Okay. But still, that's the basic idea. I mean, uh, I see that you're you're already, you're assuming some some different scenarios, but I'm not entirely sure what the assumption is. Uh, yes, you can go to the next slide already. Let's do this fast. Can you? Yeah, so, yeah. Is this the first one? This is the first one. Um, yeah, so this is what, something I've done for the Internet Society Foundation here in, in Grand View. Let's see. Let's go through the... There's a document on Data Tracker. This is way out of date. I've heard some feedback. It's better to look at the one that we have on our website and um, or into the code repo there. I have to make some changes as well. It's just really, I'm just jumping around for whether there's interest here or not. Can you continue, please? Okay. Um, so that's the sort of thing, I don't know if you know this from Baron, but you know, we, we have these uh, three different classes of, of, of communications network. I'm really looking at this kind of situation here on the, on the far, what is it, right, D, where you have a system that's these white nodes there. I don't know how visible this is. And some parts of the system cannot con communicate anymore, with, uh, anymore at this point with other parts of the system. Uh, it's not really an architecture, this one is more of a riff on the previous one. Um, but that's sort of the situation I'm talking about. And, and your drone use case has something like that. You have um, communities that might be cut off from, from you know, the network at, at specific times. That's sort of the use case I'm looking at. I'm not sure how, co uh, how, how ACE relevant they are, or how co-app relevant they are, but that's what I'm looking at. Um, next slide. I have to see what, ah, here they are. Okay, so this is not something new. Um, you know, capabilities have been around for a while. Your access token are probably kind of the same thing. I, you know, kind of probably, but not completely necessarily, because um, you put a lot of more stuff into your access token than I'm putting into capabilities. I'm really just encoding privileges. And I've had a problem finding something that does the same thing, because it seems to be tied to a different use case, like yours here in Co-op seems to be tied to specific technology. I was looking at how can we do, how can we sort of um, un untangle this a little bit? And the best thing I found is this, this uh, RFC from 1999, which is very complex and very X509 specific. So I'm not entirely sure whether this is the right um, thing to get people started on this kind of thing. Uh, next slide, please. So really, what I really wanted to do with this draft is, is just make it make it simple and generic, so that you have a very dumb, let's say, encoding of, of what what actually reads, um, people can do, uh, what 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 nodes can can uh, request from each other. Um, try to get the so the basics of that sorted and make it, like I said, small enough for zero round trips. That was sort of the the use case for me. Next slide. Right, okay, we can pretty much skip this. I'm, I'm just going to go one slide further. It's more for reading up, I think. 
No, continue, please. I, I want to hurry this up now because I've seen so much that you're doing some other stuff. All right, attribute-based authorization, you can also skip. Um, right, so, yeah, the real base of this is pretty much what I saw in your slides, actually, earlier, that you take the, all the, the, the querying of what, what a, uh, the client can actually do into the first phase, you create a signed token of the response, and you transmit the response. And in order to do this, sorry, I'm between lunch and not finding slides, I'm not <laughs> explaining this particularly well. Um, the point was to to find out what what has to be in this what has to be in this capability to, in this token to make this happen to make this relatively safe. Um, right, I'm completely lost on this to be honest. Now, I mean, I know what to tell you, but I don't know how the, how I can make this relate to you guys. Uh, can you continue? Yeah. Uh, Guren has a has a yes. question. I think. Yes, please ask questions. <laughs> that is Hi, yes. Nice to meet you. you. Hey, um, yeah, um, I, I looked at your draft and mm -hmm. I, I, I basically, my impression was, yes, we are doing something similar to this, yes, actually. Right. So that, that was that was my first impression. And I didn't uh, understand so much the differences. Uh, you now mentioned uh, zero round trips. And, yeah. and then sort of my question is, well, how do you do authorization without any form of authentication? So, I mean, we, have, we do have the OSCOR profile where you can do one, Round uh, one round right. trip, and then protects you. Uh, that gets you freshness. It protects you against mm -hmm. replay attacks, mm -hmm. and and you can do it offline. Uh, well, basically, the client needs to get the token at some point. Yeah, but, but it it's, it can be the actual authorization, the actual authentication and authorization protocol can't uh, can take can, can be carried out locally in, a, in in a basement deep down somewhere or, or where you don't have connectivity. Correct. And, and those are actually the, the use cases that people find, or the, that that's the use cases where people find use for, for ACE. They, they, that, they think that is attractive, they, they, that offline aspect. So, okay. so yes, I, um, and then encoding access rights. Well, there is something fairly lightweight called AIF, authorization information format. Uh, okay. So in, in ACE, we are, we are encoding REST operations. It's like you can do either get yes. or put to yeah. post. So then it's like a bitmap of, of, of either get put post a map or combination of that and that, mm -hmm. that type of content you could carry. So it can also be made. I, I agree that the access tokens uh, we have shown here are, are kind of lo lots of information, but you can make that more complex. So I, I didn't understand what was actually um, different or what was new, and I didn't understand the zero. Yeah, honestly, I didn't. I don't understand either because I was I was told to to come here and take this here because there was might might be the most interesting place, in, <laughs> most interesting place in ITF for this kind okay. of thing. Yeah. And looking at the presentations earlier, I saw that you were doing more or less the same thing already, like you just said. So I, I don't really know if that's that's the right place to take this. Um, yes. Well, in a sense, yes, you have you have reinvented um, the same wheel. So that sounds yes. sounds good. Dif dif different different path to the same conclusions, basically. Yeah. yeah. Um, Good. Yeah, uh, that, that's it. I guess that also answers my question that this working group already has has what it needs. But I will, well, I mean, I will look know, at what you're doing and, and take a look if I can can give you some feedback. Yes, please. I think that would be very valuable. I mean, um, you have experience with drones and other situations which are const sort of constraint settings, every byte counts and so on. So yes, if you would have interest in reviewing or just having a look, yeah, yeah, yeah. that would be excellent. It was Thank just, you very much. Uh, very spur of the moment. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. So, uh, Jens uh, and Goran, so my reading is that, uh, uh, Jens, you're basically okay with uh, merging your work with uh, what's already been done in the working group. Yes, if that's if that's the way if that's the way that can work. Yes, absolutely. I don't. I honestly don't know what there is any is if there is anything that is specifically relevant to you. Um, looking at what you're doing, you're encoding way more information into one of these X token than I would, but that's really down to trying to optimize this uh, for, for, for the zero round trip time situation, um, which might not apply to you all the time, right? Maybe maybe that's that's one way to look at this is to, to uh, sort of look at this as an optimization to, to what you can, what you have to transport. Maybe maybe it's not relevant. I'm fine. No. 
And I, I think I think it, it could be. I mean, let's say that you have a special case mm -hmm. where where you don't need to carry all the information that we do in the token. Coming back with that type of feedback would be great, and then we can look at uh, sort of optimized profiles and so on. That that might definitely make sense. Sounds good to me. Yeah, I'll t I'll take a look at what you have because you know honestly I didn't have the time to come in, to do that before I came here, but uh, that sure. might make sense. Yes. Yeah, this and, sounds and, like a good topic to continue on the list and figure out uh, where there's a good match or not. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Well, um, thanks for having me. Thanks. Um, so, so our apologies for losing the main screen. We're not sure what happened to the TV. <laughs> um, we still have 10 minutes. There was one presentation, but I don't think we have to present her for that um, either way. So uh, I think that presentation would not have happened anyway, but you can look at the presentation that's in the data tracker. So um, with that, we have 10 minutes left. So uh, we can do a, any open business. If anyone has anything they want to raise, we now have 10 minutes. And, and Goran, oh, yes, that's true. Goran had an item on our last call. Yeah, I did, I did have one. So um, I looked at the minutes um, from last meeting, which was hidden in, in the lake. As you remember, it was collocated with lake. So, so I, I copy paste the minutes into the chat here. And as I read it, uh, there is this group OSCore profile uh, draft, which is in version 11. Uh, it's been around for a while. And, and I, I thought we agreed to actually go forward with a working group as call, uh, adoption call on that one. But um, maybe someone yes. could comment on that. Yes, that's correct. Um, we, so um, team just uh, entered, um, joined a working group recently. We're still catching up on uh, all of those items. And sorry if we uh, gave an impression that it's no longer the case. It's definitely the case. Um, let me and uh, Tim and I need to speak about uh, the, uh, the other remaining items and then we'll send the call for adoption. Is that okay with you, Goran? Sounds good, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My apologies. So, so um, we we did just have a recent chair change, and uh, we, um, uh, unfortunately, there was a little uh, not really a lot of time in the weeks leading up to ITF to uh, for the for the three of us to work together. So, my apologies for that. But uh, we'll we'll um, we'll go through all the lists of the documents and make sure that everything is in the right state and that we're moving things forward. So, uh, thank you for your patience, Karen. No worries. And if there's nobody else, then this is the end of the meeting and you have eight minutes to raise the other meetings to the welcome goodbye reception. <laughs> and I hope that all of you have a safe trip back home.